to the lion's den um it's been a while and we have for you the great william albrecht master apologist uh dear brother thank you so much william for coming on bro uh, brother for you thank you for having me definitely um very humbling introduction um and and all credit to uh if there is anything great about me it's all glory to god the only thing great that i can take credit for is copying from the great church fathers that came before before us and those great saints before us. Pretty easy when you got that great work laid out before you, a uh, great checklist of stuff where you just go read the Bible and the fathers and this particular teaching we're going to be talking about today, very clearly laid out there, brother. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Um, and as for anybody who who uh, wants to know what we're the title, you know, the intercession of the saints and. Uh, if anyone knows William, which I'm sure all of you do, his his channel, the link is in the description. Uh, go check it out. Uh, he's a, a he's an apologist. Um, just he's a great apologist in general, but very particular also to uh, Protestantism, to Islam, and to other other groups. Um, so you'll get this question a lot, right, William? Is you yeah. guys um, you ask the saints to pray for you and things like that, and then. I'm guessing usually the arguments from the other side are things like it's a late thing. You guys added it. Yeah. Um, and um, maybe we can we can start off getting into the kind of the historiosity of like yeah. how old this actually is asking asking the holy ones to pray for us. So we can really date it all the way back to ancient Judaism. We look in the Old Testament and. And, and maybe that really is where we uh, begin to encounter issues because one particular book that we both could hearken to, Book of Second Maccabees, uh, is by and large not found in Protestant Bibles, as you know very well. We've done multiple shows talking about the issue of the canon. And of course, when we use that term, we use it because our evangelical friends uh, understand that to, that to mean the contents of the Bible. But for apostolic churches, really, our life of the faith is lived out through the liturgy. We are liturgically based churches, and that's the way it's been from the beginning. You didn't have people walking around with a leather skin uh, KJV back then. But we encountered that issue right away, that if somebody were to tell us, okay, give me one example from the Old Testament, I could point to Second Maccabees and the uh, the high priest Anias uh, interceding for the people. And you right away, you will have a Protestant that may try to thumb through their Bible, and they're not going to find that there. Right away, we encounter an issue there to where they're going to wonder, okay, well, why do you have it? Why don't I? Uh, but we can point immediately to this being found in ancient Judaism. And of course, we believe that our apostolic faiths, of course, become that fulfillment of those prophecies that were there in, within the ancient Judaic faith. It carries on over into Easter into early Christianity. And I think one thing that we can all agree upon, whether it be Catholic, Orient Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, even the Assyrian Church of the East, is the idea of intercession of the saints. We all believe in it. We all agree with it. Um, and it didn't take any pope coming down to dogmatize that. We all believe it because it's been there from the beginning, brother. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I don't know if you know, William, uh, you're you're huge in the OO community. Like you wow. have a ton of OO fans, uh, huge awesome. OO fans. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, Humbling. Yeah, they're very, very big fans of yours. So, um, I love them. I love Oriental Orthodoxy, brother. We love, love you no too, brother. So, I love you guys, I, I, I wanted to ask you in your experience, have you ever gotten Job 5 1 where they say, uh, to, um, to which of the holy ones will you turn? Yeah. Have you gotten that as like, oh, look, see, there isn't, he can't ask for it. See, for, for me, when I read it, it's like, to me, it shows the opposite side, that it, right. you can actually ask for intercession. Yeah, which uh, I, don't, I don't gather how they are looking at it, and they're interpreting it in a different way than we would interpret it. I interpret it exactly like you. Uh, if you look at it face value, clearly there is a possibility to turn to holy ones to intercede for you. Um, even if you have a case where the Bible is laying out a negative kind of aspect in the sense that maybe the Bible would say, in any particular given case, you're unable to do that. Well, it doesn't mean that's always the case. It, right. it means that there is a possibility to begin with. And I think yep. that if we begin with looking at the Old Testament and then we move on over to the New Testament, I think very clearly we have this teaching taught. And I think another thing that really does divide us with our evangelical friends, and I've never gotten a clear answer on this, brother, depending on who you talk to. You might talk to Pastor Bob downtown, down the street, Pastor Greg, and I've always put this forth and I've asked him, okay, those that are in heaven, are they alive or are they dead? And I'm talking about if you're going to tell me that we know they're physically dead. We, right. Nobody's arguing against them being physically dead. But are they in heaven, in Christ, are they living? Because we're told in the Bible over and over that God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to tell me they're dead in heaven, there's a big problem there. The, God is the God of the living. And then if a Protestant will, will give you the correct answer and say they're alive, well, then you go to 1 Corinthians where we read that we're the body of Christ. We're connected to one another. Well, are they now cut off because they're in heaven? If they're more alive than they were when they were on earth, no longer a shackle to their human body, well, are they cut off? And if, they, if they're not cut off, then why are they unable to intercede for us? And I think I've never gotten a clear answer from any of them. Indeed, you don't even get a clear one from Martin Luther. So I don't think you're going to get a clear one from modern-day evangelicals either. Yeah, you know, um, in my experience, and you have much more, in my experience with them, it's a circular argument. So, like, for example, I will say to them, um, with this, what you said about God is the God of the living, not the dead. Yeah. And and they'll see, you know, I'll use the, the passage where the Sadducees are trying to trap him, and then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the living. No doubt. And then they'll say, okay... Uh, because uh, first they would they would kind of come at it well they're dead and then they and then you show them this and like okay but how can they all hear you so are you are you past the part that they're alive now like right we agree on this and then um they try to go to verses like i think it was timothy 215 or something 315 right. uh the mediator there verse. you go yeah um mm -hmm. and it's like yes absolutely there is not a single apostolic church that is saying this unique position of Christ being the God man, the only mediator between all of creation and the Father, no yeah. one else has that place, just Him. So when the saints are praying for us, they're praying for us on the created side of, of uh, what is it called? Uh, like the ontological gap. No doubt. And they are asking their mediator, who is Christ. Christ is the mediator of Mary, of Peter, of all the saints Amen. for us. So then no one is, is replacing him or adding a, a person in that role. We're no still doubt. saying the whole body of Christ can pray for each other, just like yeah. you said. Without a uh, doubt. And I think Revelation also shows a lot of... Uh, sure does. Like, like, yeah. What is it? Uh, chapter Re five chapter revelation six, chapter. five yeah no yeah. no you bring up a great point too and i think that point that uh look when i was an evangelical uh uh 
the, the passage of Timothy of the one mediator, I would use, utilize that all the time. And it, when you actually do begin to look at what is being taught there, look, you don't even need to look at the Greek. Look at it and read it in plain English, and you're going to realize that it is being taken out of context by them. Nobody is arguing that our Lord is not the one mediator, the God-man that died on the cross for our sins. By the way, the way that Greek word mesites is used, that is what it's referring to every time in the New Testament. So we're not arguing that Mary, we're not arguing that any of the great saints are the mediators that died on the cross for our sins. The Bible talks about all kinds of people that can mediate. Mm. There is one unique mediator, the God-man that Timothy is talking about. Nobody would ever argue against that. But I think that they're reading a text that is not even talking about the topic at hand, wrenching it out of context, and then saying, well, look, you're making Mary and them a mediator. No, we're not. Understand what we're talking about. We're talking about them praying for us, taking our prayers before the Lord, as Revelation 5 says, that the saints in heaven do do, and as we know, the apostolic churches have taught and believed from the beginning. Look, the other day, you know this very well, brother. The other day, we did a show. And I don't know if it's out yet. We did a show with Dr. McCollum where we talked about Word of God and Word of the Lord. How if you do a word search in the Bible, whether it be the Hebrew or the Greek or what have you, Word of the Lord and Word of God never, ever appear in strict reference to Scripture, ever. You got prophecies uttered or oral uttered prophecies or the word of the Lord being the Lagos, being Christ. With that in mind, you need to realize in the early church, the church lived a liturgically based life. You'd go to mass, you would go and you would hear, you'd hear the teachings. Of the, let's say you went to, say you lived in the time of the great um, St. Cyprian and you went to church, right? Likely you would, no, without a doubt, you would hear you would attend Mass, the Holy Eucharistic Sacrifice. You would hear those great saints beforehand. You'd hear Scripture being read. But the lived life of the faith was a liturgically based faith. So they would pray for the dead. Mm -hmm. They would pray for them. They didn't need to open it up and say, okay, well, where is this? We need to find it in the New Testament. They didn't live by the principle of Bible alone. That would have been very anachronistic, wouldn't it have been, brother? That's the key. That's the key yeah. is... This was all happening before a letter of the New Testament was written down. Yep. So, uh, you know, Revelation 6 gives us a little bit of insight when it talks about the martyrs, who it says the martyrs, the souls of the martyrs were under the altar, right? Yeah. And if you see, Eusebius talks about this in other places uh, in church history where the early Christians before the days of the actual pub the churches being open when it was still illegal yeah. um, they were using coffins as altars and putting right. the relics of the saints under the altar at, yeah. in and the, the idea of revelation having this kind of the souls of the martyrs under the altar what does that mean is because they're interceding for us no doubt so when the martyrs in revelation 6 are asking uh jesus they say, when will you avenge us? Yeah. Isn't this intercession? No doubt. And not only that, they are no longer alive, yet they are aware that they need to be avenged for what happened. They're aware of it. So the idea that when you're dead, you're cut off, you no longer have any awareness, you're in the kind of like Jehovah's Witnesses say, soul sleep, it is totally foreign. That idea is foreign to the Bible. Rather, we have, we're told over and over in the Bible that the great saints are put in charge of things in heaven. And I, I, I always get confused. Is it Hebrews 12? Yeah, Hebrews 12 really does. You look at Hebrews 12, and there's no way around it. Look at Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, by the way, I want to remind the audience, right before Hebrews 12, 1, all throughout Hebrews 11, we have what has been dubbed and even Ephraim has commentary in Hebrews 11, by the way, wonderful commentary. Hebrews 11 have what is, has what is dubbed the Great Hall of Faith Commission. So you've got the author to the letter of Hebrews talking about great saints that have gone before us that are now in heaven. But then Hebrews 11 will end. Hebrews 12 will begin and we'll read. 
Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, mm -hmm. let us lay aside every weight. And I don't want to, if I am correct, Hebrews 12, 1, let me pull it up and let me look at the Greek because this is quite significant. Number one, it is very significant that we're told we are surrounded by them. I mean, if they're, they're no longer alive, we were surrounded by them. And yeah, I am pretty positive. Yeah, here it is. Here's the Greek word. Right here, where the author of the letter of the Hebrews is telling you, a great cloud of witnesses surround us. It uses a Greek word for martyrs. Mm. Literally telling you, those great ones that surround us in our everyday walk of life, they're no longer alive. There's no way around what Hebrews 12 tells you. No way around it. And any way you want to look at it, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the idea that we are able to ask for the intercession of the saints is biblical. It is biblical. And I hear it all the time, brother. That, well, why would we do that? Why even do that? Why not only go directly to the head, Christ? Well, look, to my evangelical friends that go up to Pastor Greg and tell Pastor Greg to pray for them and to pray for their family, don't be hypocritical. If you're going to criticize one aspect of intercession and say, go only to Christ, well, then go. don't go to Pastor Greg and tell him <laughs> to pray for you and your family. Be consistent. And that is one thing that they're not, because I, I dare say, even though they claim to be Bible alone, at the end of the day, they're not a Bible alone based faith. So, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I want to add to, so with uh, 1 Timothy 2.5 that we mentioned earlier, yeah. the mediator verse, I think the first or second verses, it talks about intercessory prayers right before. No doubt. Right away. Um, yep. Yeah. And and uh, in Revelation 5, it talks about um, our prayers going up to heaven <laughs> in the hands of the elders who give it yeah. to the lamb. Why is it going into the hands of the elders who give it into the, to the lamb? Why doesn't it go to the lamb directly? Because yeah. it's one big liturgy, one united liturgy that's happening, there heaven and earth, one united worship that's being offered to Jesus. Yeah. No um, doubt. And the saints in heaven are the ones giving it to him. Yeah. So, uh, and then in Revelation 8, uh, it says he took the, the incense that had the prayers of the saints in heaven and he threw it to the earth and then it caused an earthquake meaning the intercessory prayers of the saints in heaven are efficacious so uh you have all of this in the bible we haven't even touched patristics yet this is just been. biblical and look how much is there and we didn't touch jewish tradition bc we didn't touch yeah. that either you're right yeah. but you, you, to touch upon that point you brought up a great point in Revelation 5, 8, what you've got there is a liturgical, liturgical imagery. Now, I've heard the reply, the retort from our evangelical friends. Well, you've got apocalyptic imagery here. I don't care what you want to tell me. They're in heaven. They are glorified in heaven. And don't tell me I've even heard evangelicals say they're not glorified. How can you be impure and be in heaven? Wrap, help me wrap my head around that. I cannot wrap my head around that. They're glorified. They're in heaven. You've got liturgical imagery here because the Greek word for the elders is presbuteroi. Literally, in a liturgical kind of setting, they are offering the prayers of the Lamb. We know the Lamb is our Lord. We know that. Now, I've heard the people come around and say, well, you have no idea that they actually knew what the prayers were. Well, if they're in possession of the prayers, logically, they know what the prayers are. But even if I grant even if I grant our evangelical friends that, no matter what, you've got intercession here. Because they are receiving the prayers from the holy ones on earth, and they are bowing down and handing them to our Lord. Mm -hmm. Any way you look at it, you've got intercession of the saints right here in Revelation 5, 8, and very powerfully laid out as well. You laid out how we, we haven't even gotten to the early fathers, but what... <laughs> What truly does blow me away, brothers, no matter where you look, Mark chapter 12, and I'm looking at my notes here, Mark 12, Luke 20, 38, Matthew 20, uh, 22, 31 to 32, what we read of, particularly Luke 20, 38, for he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, 
all live unto him. And the Greek there is in the present, zao, they are living. They currently live in God. So the idea that when you are dead, that you're cut off in some way, really is not biblical. And the other idea that, well, you've got to be omniscient to be able to hear all these other prayers. That's only a trait of God. Number one, nobody claims the saints are omniscient. But another thing, we don't believe that they are shackled and limited like they were when they are on earth, when they were on earth. Very okay. clearly, we have that laid out in the book of Revelation, where John at one point hears uh, uh, people on earth, under the earth, in the heavens, everywhere. And he hears them in a manner in which modern day evangelicals will tell you, well, that very clearly seems sounds like one would be omniscient. No, it doesn't. They're adding that because we're not telling anybody that Mary, Holy Mary, or our Mother Mary, or any of the saints have the power to know everything. No, I think they're ripping and wrenching everything out of context, brother. So, William, there's a question here. Yeah. Prayer is only worship. So if you ask Mother Mary to pray for you, are you worshiping her? Yeah. I truly think this is where we really, really go off the rails with modern-day evangelicals. Number one, if you look at the Greek word prosuke, or many other Greek words that are utilized for petition, it merely means to ask, to petition. Mm -hmm. It doesn't literally mean that we are worshiping one. Not at all. Mm -hmm. That is not how the Bible or the early fathers utilize that. And ultimately, one thing I would like to add, ultimately we all know that it is God and God alone who ultimately answers all prayer. The saints are interceding for us. Doesn't mean that they are the ones that have the power of God. That is another thing that we need to add very clearly. And I think another area where we really, really diverge from our evangelical friends is their idea of worship is very, very different than ours. You go into an, any evangelical church and depending where you go, the first hour or two can be full of just chanting and singing modern day hymns. They will call that worship. They will do that over and over. Whereas you go to an Oriental Orthodox church or a Catholic church or any apostolic church, and we don't call that worship. We Rather, we call what is going on there in the lived liturgical life, the holy sacrifice of the mass, when we bow down because we truly believe, like the Bible says and the early fathers believed, that our incarnate Lord and Savior is truly present body, blood, and soul, divinity in the Holy Eucharist. Now, we call that worship. Now, if you ask me, brother, I think that ours is closer to what the Bible says and Clearly. what the early church says. Well, so right away, there's that disconnect, massive yeah. disconnect. When they think, <clears throat> look, I, I have I've got no problem, brother. I want to be clear. I'm going to be fair. I'm not going to be um, mean to our evangelical friends. A lot of them really love the Lord and they mean well. I'm not criticizing that they praise the Lord by, by singing to the Lord. Not at all. What I have a problem with is that there is no Eucharistic sacrifice there. There is no altar there. Rather, they merely have that praise via singing. Well, I can find that on YouTube. Yeah. I can find that on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. You need the liturgically lived life of the church. You're not going to get that at any Protestant church, brother. And, and uh, uh, God dictates the form of worship he accepts. So he tells us how he wants us to worship him. We don't just pick however we want to worship him. So the form of worship that we see in Revelation is the worship that's happening in heaven. It's a very yeah. liturgical worship. It's altars and incense and chanting. Yep. It's not strobe lights and drum sets and no. things like that. No. So and uh, what we see in heaven is what Moses patterned his worship after. No so doubt. actually, what Moses we did the the New Testament Apostolic Church did not um, copy Old Testament worship. It's actually on the contrary. Moses and the Old Testament is copying what will be the fullness of worship, which is us. No doubt, so that is the worship in heaven. Yeah. Um, when Malachi says. Um, the Gentiles will offer grain and incense. Yeah. Where is this? This is us, you know. 
Um, now there's yeah, another. That, I'm trying to find that one, brother. Let me just pause for one moment on that. That is a really good point. I think um, chapter uh, one, I think verse eleven or something. Is it is it one eleven? I always get it mixed up. Uh, I think you are you're, you're correct. Let me see. And the reason why, yeah, here we go. Look at that. For from the rising of the sun, even to going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name, and a pure oblation or a pure offering. Hmm. I got to be very clear. Where do you have that in evangelical churches? You don't have that. Mm -mm. You do not. You don't have That's it. a problem. Uh, now, there's another question we have here, William. Um, find it. Where is it? It's Gabriel. There it is. Okay. Okay. So how can all the saints hear us at the yeah. same time? So right now I'll pull up that passage in the book of Revelation. Yeah. And in fact, let me pull it up right now. Great one. And I want him to read it. Here we go. Okay. Look at what John tells you. And, and the reason I want to read it. And I want to emphasize before I read it, how when you are in heaven, you do not have the shackled limitations that you had when you were on earth. And we clearly have it. Look at Revelation 5.13. And this is a really important one because here you have John, you have a vision here. John sees the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down from heaven to the new earth. And while he is in the new city, he hears a loud voice. Now, I want you to look at this. I'm going to read the New King James. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. But look at that. Every creature in heaven, on earth and under the earth as such as are in the sea. Look at that. He tells you all that, th that are there, I heard them. Now, are you going to tell me that that attribute of John being able to specially be able to hear them is only for God and God alone? According to the Bible, it's biblical. Great so point, I want, William. Great. I see, it's a biblical point, too, which, by the way, I looked at it and I was able to find a few early fathers that interpreted that in the exact way that we're laying it out. Fuzz, I want to emphasize for that person there. By the way, congratulations for being part of an apostolic church because you are, you are, there you go. Yes, you are on the right road. And I want to emphasize for you. We do not have, when we are in heaven, by the grace of God, we do not have the limitations that we would have when we were here on earth, shackled to our mortal coil, to our body. Very different in heaven. How do we know that? We've got that multiple examples in the Bible laid out. And then you have that example in Revelation 5 where they're receiving the prayers of the saints on earth. Another good example, and I want to, let me pull it up. I love this one. You've got here in 2 Maccabees 5, 11 to 16, you have very clear <coughs> evidence that the ancient Jews believed in the intercession of the saints. Judas Maccabeus, we're told, had a vision, and we're told it is most worthy of believing in. An incredible vision. How two dead men, they're dead, they're not alive anymore. The high priest Onias and the prophet Jeremiah, what are they doing? They're interceding with God for the Jews. Clearly, mm. we've got an example of when we are no longer alive, when we are in heaven with the Lord, we do not have those limitations that we had when we were here on earth. And I think that the Bible over and over lays this out very clearly. Absolutely. And I just want to add, uh, you know, T William's in Texas and I'm in California. And yep. we're talking to each other. What's stronger, the Holy Spirit or the Internet? So if, yeah. we, have the same, if we have the same Holy Spirit, who is in us, who is in St. Mary, who is in St. Peter, and we are one Amen. body in Christ, all of us. So then how is there not communication? How, yeah. how is there not? Like if I'm able to talk to William, he's in another state. 
but I yep. can't talk to Mary because she doesn't have a cell phone. Like yep. I don't understand. Like what? Um, th- this is th- it's insane to think about, and it's very earthly and worldly. It's a worldly no way. doubt, no um, doubt, very very worldly way. And and I I'm reminded of a, of a work that I found, and and I could pull it up in a moment if you want the whole quote. Found it many years ago. And uh, I was never able, I, uh, to this day, I, I, do not, I do not have the whole work with me. But I was able to find a paragraph of it quoted in a very, very old, dusty Catholic apologetics book. And it had a little quote from Ephraim. And I said, man, you know what? We know that there's a lot of works out there that are not from Ephraim. Of course, I reached out to Dr. Brock and I confirmed it is legitimately from Ephraim. And Ephraim there, how mind-blowing. Ephraim there will point to the Old Testament examples of being able to to pray for one another and then says that, well, if that was possible in in the olden times, how much more possible is it now that we offer the holy sacrifice? But the one thing that he does lay out as as he's he's clearly older in life, I don't think he believes he's going to be alive any longer, and he tells those that are, that love him that want to go to his grave and to, to lay very expensive perfumes there, he tells them, look, I don't want those perfumes. Rather, shower me with your prayers. Pray for me. That is more valuable than any expensive perfume. Absolutely. And I've always found that prayer, that, that not that prayer, that, that laying out of how important prayer is for the dead. Because he knows exactly. I'm going to be gone but, soon. But yeah, pray the, for me. It's incredible. Con- I think the context of that, if I remember the, the quote, you remember it, uh, is um, where he says, "Don't bury uh, bury me in an unmarked grave. Don't bury me with the rich. Bury me with the poor." You are correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, beautiful. No doubt. I love that. Incredible. Um, and, and you know, uh, William, in your experience with evangelicals and Protestants, is Ignatius of Antioch an authority that they would respect? Without a doubt. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. They'll, they'll, they will, um, unfortunately, they're going to cherry pick from the early fathers. Uh, but yeah, they do. They'll respect Ignatius without a doubt. So here's, I found something. Let me know what you think. This is St. Ignatius of Antioch. Sure. And Tralians, mm-hmm. chapter 13, the last chapter of Tralians. And this is the Michael Holmes translation, which is my favorite of. Right. Of, apostolic fathers i think he's baptist correct me if i'm wrong i think you're correct yeah okay so this is what this is the this is what saint ignatius says he says my spirit is dedicated to you not only now but also when i reach god wow so this is never this is yeah tralians 13 saint ignatius of antioch yeah my spirit is dedicated to you, not only now, but also when I reach God, because he's on his way to martyrdom, as we know. Right, yeah. So he's saying to them, okay, I'm praying for you now. My spirit is dedicated for you now. Not only now, also when I reach God, I'm going to still be praying for you. That, that's pretty powerful. I had never I had never noticed that before. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, um, I don't see anything. Like, I always, I tell him, I say, if intercession of the saints was wrong, wouldn't we have somebody addressing it early? Like, hey, guys, you guys are doing this. Stop. Don't do this anymore. It's yeah. wrong. It's polytheistic or whatever it is. Um, you know, I and I, from what I've seen, even the Jews in the Old Testament, the, the Jewish tradition, B.C., has intercession of saints. Yeah. Uh, I, think I, don't, the, I don't know if they have it anymore. I don't know. But uh, they do. They used to for, oh, they do. They still they do. do. Okay. Oh, yeah, cool. they do. And I think you bring up a really good point there, because early on, uh, no matter where you look in the early church, all throughout early church history, you have got the condemnation of polytheism over and over and over. And you even have the condemnation of necromancy, which is another thing that we are accused of. Now, if the early fathers condemned all of those things, all the while knowing that prayer and intercession were biblical, they were ancient, but I think that tells you very well they were able to draw those distinctions that modern-day Protestants cannot draw, uh, and they don't want to draw them. Now, I find that to be very, 
very disappointing because I, I know that deep down, a lot of them wish that they could continue praying for their departed loved ones or believing that their departed loved one can pray for them, help them draw, help draw them closer to the Lord. But they're shackled by their very poorly developed theological system. And that's a big problem, brother. A and massive from, problem. From what you've seen from the early reformers, uh, Luther and those guys, what is their view on this? And yeah. um, and I think there have been exceptions in the Protestant kind of um, tradition. Like I think C.S. Lewis believed in intercession, if I'm not as Yeah, he so, did. Now, I want to recommend a book. And, yeah. and every now and then... You don't have to be Catholic. It's very valuable just to know the mindset of Luther at the beginning. I highly mm. recommend every now and then, I, if, you, if you look at Amazon, you might not find it. Uh, oh, man, I'm trying to get it to appear there. There we go. The Incredium. Now, every now and then it'll appear for a very affordable price on Amazon or on eBay. A lot of the times it's not even there. You can click a notification to be notified when it does come into stock um, and get a copy of, of it if you can. Why do I recommend it? The Incaridian is written by Johann Eck. John Eck was a Catholic priest, incredible debater, incredible orator. And I recommend it because it is a diary of sorts that will lay out the debates that he had with Luther. And I recommend it because it will show you that early on, Luther had no problem with prayer to the dead and no problem with intercession. Why do I point that out as being important? Because if Protestantism can continue to evolve and evolve and evolve, do you want to be a part of that? Where, mm -hmm. where maybe right now they believe one thing, but your children that may grow up shackled in that faith, by the time they're an adult, it's evolved to the point where it was different before. And don't tell me it hasn't evolved. Every reformer, Calvin, Luther, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, even Turretin, incredibly anti-Catholic, all of them believed Mary was perpetual virgin. I would be shocked if I walked into an evangelical church today and they preach that. They won't preach that. Right. The early reformers believe in the Dormition and the Assumption. They believe these things about Mary that we believe today, and today they don't teach that anymore. Another example is intercession of the saints, where early on it was believed. Look, brother, people, they point to um, that early figure, John Huss, as a forerunner to the Reformation. Well, guess what? He believed in prayer for the dead. Early on, Luther believed in that. Now, if you want to look at Calvin and later reformers, I don't doubt it. Yeah, they shed that belief. They dropped that belief. But what does that tell you? that Protestantism continues to mutate over and over. And I would never want, I would never want to be a part of that. And I wouldn't want my family to be a part of that either. You know, it, it's funny. They kind of testify against themselves because they admit when you ask them, uh, you say, yeah. are you, are you a hundred percent right? Like your church is infallible. They tell you no. no. <laughs> so that, you know, that yeah, you know that it's wrong. No doubt. What do they say about our Lord saying children have angels? that come before the face of the Father. Or what about the angel that holds the censer of the prayers in Revelation? We talked about Revelation 8 earlier, but yeah, yeah. that's another good point. He says that they see uh, the, the their angels see the face of the Father in heaven. Jesus. Yeah, they do. Now, yeah. I have gotten multiple different replies on that, on the angel yeah. ones. Um, I have had people tell me, yeah, angels can intercede. Saints cannot. And then I've had people that really just want to look at everything that has to do with intercession of those in heaven as a kind of vision or something symbolic, you never get anything consistent from them, brother. I hate to be, I, you know, I'm not trying to be polemical, but yeah. you're not going to get a consistent answer from them. You're right. Right. And here, uh, pro-life Chloe. Um, yeah. King Saul, that's the whole necromancy thing that we were yep. talking about earlier. No doubt. Yeah. Well, it, it wasn't even St. Samuel that, the person conjured up it was not at all yeah not at all 
what is their supposed alternative to believing that the saints are alive with Christ? Soul sleep. To... Have you have you uh, ran mm. into soul sleep <laughs> Protestants? Is that a thing? Yeah, yeah, I have. Oh, it I is. Really have. Okay. Yeah, very, very odd. Wow. Um, I don't think that they realize that they are adopting a form of Jehovah's Witness belief. I don't think that they mm-hmm. realize that. Um, That's crazy. And temporary annihilation. Yeah, I've 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 run into that as well. In fact, earlier today. Oh my goodness! We're gonna have to do, and I'm glad I, I'm remembering. We're gonna have to do a show very soon. Earlier today, I got bombarded with people defending uh, annihilationism, and then I got bombarded with people defending universalism. I mean, I had one guy that uh, they saw a video that you and I did mm. um, many months ago, and he began bombarding the chat today, posting that origin should be a canonized saint, um, and defending all kinds of things of origin. Look, I want to be very clear to people. If you're not part of an apostolic church, very clearly you're going to believe very wacky things out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, inspiring philosophy says that uh, I have no idea what inspiring philosophy says, but the idea that Jerome would have said it when Jerome wrote a tract uh, condemning that, no, it's yeah. not possible. Not right. at all. No. Right. Um, yeah, it looks like if we speak of paradise, the place of bliss appointed the spheres. Yeah, I, I again, yeah, um, tell William to answer. Which, okay. what is it? What is William supposed to answer? Tertullian, yeah, I don't, I don't know what you, yeah, what I don't you know, want to answer. Yeah, I'm not sure, mm-hmm. but. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that in order for evangelicals to justify their position on this, just like they would have to on the other points that they believe, um, they would really need to be open about Christianity was wrong this whole time. Yeah. And then what we have is right because we're smarter than everybody else. I think that yeah. it kind of boils down to them being honest about that they think that about themselves because as we've showed from shown from ignatius of antioch from the scripture and then ignatius is super early we didn't even mm-hmm. touch on like the the later stuff right um, Subtum praesdium is that like third century or something yep it uh, sure is right. and and we even have um hippolytus of rome mm-hmm. writing the commentary in daniel tells you tell me you three boys Remember me, I entreat you, that I may also obtain the same lot of martyrdom with you. Look at that. They're dead. Mm -hmm. But he is wanting them to intercede for him. That is very early on. That is early 200s. Then you're correct about that, the subtum presidium. Uh, And then look at this, St. Cyprian of Carthage, writing in the early 3rd century, tells you, let us remember one another. In concord and unanimity, let us on both sides always pray for one another. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Both sides always pray for one another in mutual love. And I could go on and on. There's one that I found that I'd never heard anybody bring up before, brother. And I want to share it with you and your audience. Um, Maybe you have heard of it, but I remember when I was preparing for a debate many years ago on the topic. Uh, my interlocutor made a comment, which I don't know why you would even do that, arguing that, well, uh, you know, by the time you get to the fourth century, uh, many of the early fathers no longer believed that prayer to the prayer to the saints was important, which is baloney, because as you go later in history, it becomes more prevalent. Why? Not because it develops. It was there early on, but rather you have more people alive and living longer and not being martyred because they're allowed to write and they're not on the run for their lives. Hmm. You've got the great Athanasius letter to Marcelina will tell you that the departed saints, he says, he says about those that are departed in heaven, pray for them with God. Sing the Psalms as the holy men may pray with us. Look at that. He believes that they're in heaven. Sing the songs that the holy men 
may pray with us. I mean, that is incredible. If you stop and you think the great Athanasius, one of the greatest defenders of the Trinity ever, great Christologist, telling you that right there, I think that we're in good company when we stand side by side with the great church fathers, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Like we have, it's, we have a witness of 2000 years, again, to the cloud of witnesses you're talking about. We yep. have a witness even in theology and apologetics. We have a witness. Yeah. We're not making it up as we go like they are. Um, so here's the question. We, uh, I think William did a great job of addressing this earlier when he yeah. said, uh, he said um, why do we ask Mary or the saints to pray for us? The Bible. <clears throat> so again, what William said earlier and the answer to this is if you are asking anybody to pray for you, if you're asking me to pray for you, you're asking your pastor to pray for whoever you're asking to pray for you, why are you asking us? Why don't you just yeah. go to Jesus directly? So it's the same idea, but except you're asking people in heaven because they've already finished the race. They've already attained to that holiness, to that glory, that yeah. now their prayers are more powerful and efficacious than ours because they are holier than us. No doubt. And, and that is a biblical example. That their prayers are more powerful. That is why in 2 Maccabees, the high priest Ananias and the prophet Jeremiah are praying for the people of God. Mm -hmm. We're shown that their prayers are powerful to do that. That right there shows you in and of itself. And what are we told in the book of James? The prayer of a righteous man avails much. I want to be very clear. If you are in heaven, you are righteous in the Lord. Without a doubt, nothing in unclean or impure can be in heaven. And when you read about those glorified saints receiving the prayers of the holy ones on earth and giving them to the Lamb, you're shown something incredibly powerful. And I want to be very clear. I would rather St. Mary pray for me any day. Look, no, I'm me not too. disrespecting Tony at all. Tony, my friend, I'd rather St. Mary pray for me any day than Tony Petro any day. Because yeah. our holy Teotokos is much closer to the Lord than, than you or anybody living on earth. Mm -hmm. and, and Tony, it looks like you tuned in a little bit late. Because, Very late. Yeah, we, we covered all of this word word for word. Uh, yeah. So 1 Timothy 2.5 is the verse. Rewind. We covered yes. it all. Yeah. Seriously. Uh, we did. Again, I'm going to do it quick for you, real quick. Yep. Um, the one mediator being the one God man, Jesus. No one else is in that role, just him, the, the only mediator between the Father and all of creation, including the saints. So okay. Jesus is the only mediator for the saints to the Father. But the saints are still praying for us on the created side of things. So when Mary's praying for me, she's praying to who? She's praying to her one mediator and my one mediator, Jesus. Amen. Mary's praying to me for G uh, sorry, praying to Jesus for me. So, yeah, um, it's uh, it's not it's there's a misunderstanding. Again, I just told you it's like if you're asking me to pray for you, you're asking Mary to pray for you. But Mary's prayers are stronger than mine. Do you remember? You guys remember the um, the wedding in Cana? Why didn't they just go to Jesus and tell him about the wine? Yep. Mary went and told him. Why would Mary go and tell him? That's number one. Number two, he tells her, it's not my time. Woman, it's not my time. <laughs> yep. Uh, and he's God incarnate. And he changes his time because his mom asked him. Yep. Yeah. He sure does. No doubt. And I think uh, one other thing that I would point out, uh, look to Genesis 3 and the fact that, that that figure is called woman in Genesis 3.15, the mother of the Messiah. And uh, then look in particular to Galatians 4, 4, where the woman uh, is also spoken of, the mother of, the, of Christ. So the idea that Protestants like to claim that our Lord disrespected his mother as if he broke one of the commandments completely falls apart. And we've talked about that in multiple shows. So check out our Mary shows as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I, again, I think that the, the arguments against intercession – it are all straw men. Terrible. They're all they're all um, intentional misunderstandings. No doubt. Uh, you know, it's funny, William. The other day, um, I was talking to a couple of Protestants, and uh, we're talking about the 
the verse in the Ten Commandments about you know idols and right not make yourself an idol. And uh, the the conversation was in Arabic between me and them. And so I'm like, what do you guys think? Who 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 is Moses? Uh, like, who is the Ten Commandments referring to about these eyes in heaven and on the earth and under the earth? Right. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, they told me Mary and the saints. I oh, said, what? <laughs> what? I said, no way. So there are saints in heaven. And when Moses is giving the commandments to, to the people, Mary, Mary and all them are in heaven already. They weren't even born yet. So wow. who is it talking about? It's talking about that he's he's referring. The context is Egyptian paganism. No saints, doubt. I and the earth and under the earth. That's what it's talking about here. Wow. That's a good point. We've never thought about it because they're converts from uh, they were converts from the Chaldean Catholic Church. Gotcha. The Protestantism and then no way. Yeah, and and they were deceived Man, wow. into into uh, thinking that that's what the verse is about. No one told them otherwise. <laughs> and the problem with my people, Middle yeah. Eastern Apostolic Christians, please do not leave your churches without understanding your churches first. Oh no, without a doubt, and and then and make an uh, uh, an educated decision. Don't just go. Yeah, and I think that that is a great point, brother. Because uh, you know where I live. I live near the border in Texas. A uh, bunch of Hispanic people around me, and uh, very often I go from parish to parish, and I'll talk about various things. Um, and very often I am heartbroken, and I tell people from Mexico or Hispanics that that have left the faith and have gone to Protestantism, what are you doing abandoning your culture and mm -hmm. going to a faith? You know, I hear of them going to Pentecostal or Presbyterian or what have you, churches that don't even resemble those churches of the Reformers. Or they're Americanized today. And you've got these Hispanic people so proud of their culture that have abandoned it and are now going to what is really amounts to American religion. An American-based religion, uh, it is it is heartbreaking because along the way, a Catholic or an Orthodox or somebody failed miserably to help catechize them. There was poor catechism. We know this very well back in the 80s and 90s, early 2000s. Very, very poorly catechized, very poorly formed people. Uh, and it really does break my heart, but I'm here to tell them, read and read You've been lied to, and we feel terribly bad because exactly. you've been lied to. Exactly. exactly. You know, you know uh, I was in Texas, and uh, the, the the driver was Honduran. I just assumed he was Catholic, you know? Yeah. Talking about religion and stuff, and then I said something. I can't remember what it was, and he goes, wait, you so you're a Catholic? He told me. I'm like, what, what do you mean? He goes, because Catholics believe that. I right. said, aren't you Catholic? And he goes, no, uh, they're idolaters and all this stuff. Oh, I'm like, what are you talking about? And then I go into this debate with him about, you know, a thought church authority, uh, yeah. sola being heresy. You know, maybe one day, uh, William, let's do a show about sola scriptura and authority. I would love to. I yeah. would love to. Um, because I want to show people that the idea of what modern day, today, modern day evangelicals, even their idea of Bible alone differs from Luther and Calvin and them. You know why, brother? I, I know for a fact. I'm going to tell you why. They are ashamed of the fact that they need to go to tradition for much of what they believe. They have to go to tradition. So they'll tell you, well, you know, Bible alone doesn't mean everything we believe is in the Bible alone. It just means it's, you know, the ultimate authority. But, you know, we can go to tradition, still has value. Well, According to Luther, Calvin, and all of the reformers, it's Bible and Bible alone. And councils and church fathers were a mess. So, you know, I, I want to be very clear. Modern-day evangelicals, if you are tuning in, uh, read up more on the apostolic churches. You're going to be blown away that you're walking into another world. You know, I, I tell people that are near and dear friends, brother, that for me— and you'll understand this. For me, because uh, sometimes I go out of town and I, I've got uh, my sister-in-law 
and uh, and her husband are Protestant. And if I go out of town to visit them, about four hours away from where I live, first thing I'm doing is I'm popping my phone open, seeing what Catholic church I can go to for mass on Sunday. And they're inviting me, hey, you know what, you know, just one time, come with us. They don't realize, and it does break my heart telling them all the time, that what is going on at an evangelical service is downright blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Great juice and crackers. Yeah. You, you know what I mean. It yeah, is yeah. borderline demonic, and they don't even know it. You know, William, it's funny. Uh, what are we, 2024 now? Maybe 12 years ago, something like this, um, or 10 years ago. 10 years ago, uh, I was, I was, you know, in my studies of patristics, not, not yeah. the beginning. I was a little bit in it by this point. Right. And then, um, there was this lady and I don't know how, like the conversation opened. She, uh, she's Mexican mm -hmm. and, um, uh, she was a pastor, like her and her husband were pastors of the church. And then. I brought up the Apostolic Fathers. And said, Have you ever read them? And look what they say about the Eucharist. And you know, and I'm like, I'm saying it from my, I'm being very sincere and genuine, yeah. and trying to present this to her. And she says, uh, "Yeah, we do. We do it in our church with uh, uh, Pepsi and Doritos." Oh, wow. And I was so. Uh, um, oh man, like offended. <laughs> yeah, I would have been horrified. I didn't say another word. I, wow. It's like you know the whole pearls to the swine thing. Yeah. I didn't say another word because it's like that's a different, a different thing. It's a different religion, honestly, William. Like it's completely different Christianity and this umbrella. And then, no, 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 completely it's not different. That. The churches that offer a sacrifice to God, yeah. it's the Eucharist. Yep. There's a sacrifice happening, the ancient worship. That is a religion. Yep. And then the other religion are people that do the kumbaya and, and whatever else is going on. Yep. There. No For doubt. Sure. So you 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 know right where I'm at. When I get invited and I know what is going on there, and, uh, you know, if I can avoid going, <laughs> I will avoid going. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, they do not have any altars, Todd. I think that was uh, Tom there. Tom, you're right. An altar, according to the Bible, the Greek word thusiasterion, in the Bible, an altar is where sacrifice is offered. They don't mm -hmm. have altars. You're correct about that, Tom. They don't yeah. have any altars. And and in the ancient world, any type of, of religion, any type of worship would have a priest and an altar. Then you have to be the correct religion but any yeah. kind of religion in the ancient world so if a religion is two thousand years old yeah. it's going to have a priest and an altar no doubt uh, i think i think the first you know protestants if you will in the sense of just completely doing away with the priesthood that i know about are muslims yeah you're correct yeah mm -hmm. um yeah so they don't uh, even know how to how to tackle that charge when we bring it up they they it is beyond them they don't even know they have no clue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I want to thank you again, William. I appreciate you uh, coming on. And I, guys, keep an eye out for a future show with William about Amen. Sola Scriptura and authority. Without a doubt. Uh, we, just, we just did that live right now. We were talking about it. And why, why not? So we'll, we'll do that coming soon. And thank you again so much, William. I really appreciate you coming on. Brother, thank uh, you for you having have anything? me. You want to uh, close with anything or or plug anything, whatever you want to say. Uh, people can check me out. They can go to my patristicpillars.com. Uh, but I want to really above above everything, thank you for having me on. Thank you for giving me a full hour to talk with you. I love, you know that I love talking with you, brother. Uh, I truly care for you as a brother. I love my Oriental Orthodox brothers and sisters. Love them from the bottom of my heart. And um, really above everything, everybody pray for me. Pray for me. Uh, we are prepping for a debate. Myself and the brother Elijah, we're going to be defending Holy Mary. And uh, and God willing, I've got many more debates planned the rest of the year, including one, uh, including four in Spanish. So uh, 
I need a lot of prayer. Pray for me. Thanks again. Thanks again, William. Thanks again, everybody. Uh, keep an eye out. I have uh, a bunch of shows coming up um, with uh, Elijah Yassi, who William just talked about. Um, and some others. I have a Chaldean Catholic priest coming on. I have, wow. uh, yeah, keep an eye out, guys. And then one more, we're going to have at least one more, well, maybe a lot more, hopefully a lot more. Yeah. Uh, but one more, we already have the topic. So pray for us, guys. Everybody take care. Awesome.